So welcome back to the Swayu channel. Um, for everyone watching, thank you for coming back. If you haven't haven't subscribed yet, please hit subscribe right now because we've got an awesome, awesome guest this week. He is a legend um, in the movie world. He's a special effects artist. It's Lorne Peterson. Lorne, welcome to the show, sir. Oh, thank you. Thank you very, very much. Do you know what? I'm so, so excited because literally your work has influenced and inspired so many, not only in the film industry, but also audiences around the world. Um, so the first question, uh, you know, we're going to go back in time to when you first first sort of, you know, had this bug, this spark to get into this business. So what actually got you into the movie business right at the beginning? Actually, there was no uh, spark. It was an accidental meeting. Um, I believe it or not, at the time, uh, I'm not sure in England they have a McDonald's land next to. They had they had 20, 30, 40 years ago. It was like the Hamburglar was about five feet in diameter. The uh, uh, no, the hamb the Hamburger itself was about five. The, and there were swings underneath of the Hamburglar's arms, and I carved those things. It was just wow. one of the jobs that I, I did. I worked in industrial design, I did sculpture. It was any, anything actually to get a few bucks when you're 29 years, 28 years old. And I was, I just did the originals and I was checking uh, at the industrial site, uh, which was on a studio um, to see how they were going there because people were manufacturing them and painting them. And lo and behold, I came across face to face with a guy he went to college with that was working on a commercial. Uh, he was in the um, industrial design department. I was in the art department. We lived like two blocks away in Seal Beach. And uh, I came nose to nose with him. He said, oh, Lauren, I haven't seen you in a couple of years. And, you know, I'm, I'm, we're, uh, hey, uh, you're a model maker. Yes. And uh, we're working on a science fiction film in the Valley. You'd be perfect for it. Uh, we're having a hard time finding model makers, believe it or not. And... Uh, I had a small business at the time that was struggling, uh, but I didn't let anybody know that. <laughs> and uh, went and saw what was happening there, and I was just blown away. I mean, the artwork, the uh, the building, and of course, we were, you could be blown away by something smaller then because it was only uh, 20 people in the building or something like that, you know. But the artwork was really good, and some of the really rudimentary early stuff they were doing was exciting. And uh, so I did. I, mm -hmm. I had a partner, brought him along, negotiated for a better salary than they offered, and uh, was off to the, the races, you know. It was it was really a, a fun time. And I was, I think I was 29, a cusp of 30. Uh, everybody else was 19 to 30, you know. It was like... It was like it was an art department with money, mm. in a way. From all the footage, I mean, it's amazing that you were one of the first crew members of what we know as Industrial Light and Magic. And from the actual um, videos that we've seen on online and that's been posted, um, it's it's crazy to think that you actually got any work done because it looked so much fun. It was like <laughs> slide, slide, sliding down water slides, and and it just seemed yeah. like a really good bunch of people. I mean. What was it like in those those times? Because it must have been incredible. Because did you realize the amount of pressure that, you know, what you were doing was eventually yeah. for Star Wars? Uh, it, it built. Uh, it was building up. You know, you're, you're right. Uh, you know, like I mentioned, everybody was in their 20s. Uh, and those uh, water slides was lunchtime because we worked... Uh, at least in the film business in California, it was a 10-hour day. You didn't get paid for lunch. So it was 11 hours. And uh, the valley where we um, is known for being very hot in, out in L.A. It's very inland from the ocean. And uh, inside the building did not have air conditioning. Uh, you know, it had a fan, a little fan and a vent in the back. And uh, it was very, very hot. It would get over 100 degrees. So we all wore shorts and, you know, T-shirts and that kind of thing. And uh, you're right, it was, it was very fun. Uh, many, many times on a Friday night, we'd clear the floor, the cement floor, and have uh, dancing and music. 
uh, if you see from the pictures, uh, Grant, who was the head of the department model shop, he bought uh, these giant Yamaha speakers and um, a turntable and an amplifier. That was one of his first purchases, I think, is to have uh, good music. And uh, Songs on the Key of Life was uh, the big album then with Stevie Wonder, uh, Fleetwood Mac, um, Super Tramp, things like that yeah. were uh, blasting out. Not all the time, but uh, every once in a while it'd be like a, a music break for 20 minutes and then it would be off and be do you working. Know, but, do you know what? I can just imagine now a mix CD coming out from ILM, you know, on the music <laughs> that you listen to while creating these incredible models i mean i think all workplaces should take a leaf out of those books of in the se in in the 70s because uh it makes people work a lot better but when we talk about star wars there are iconic iconic models that i mean from the star destroyer you know the star and and the x x wing which which models were you directly involved in actually making it, it, I'll tell you, but it'll always be easier to say the ones I wasn't involved with. Uh, but um, w the way it happened was that I and my partner were hired uh, to work on the Death Star. And I realized fairly quickly that the other model makers didn't want to do that job because it was basically on your knees uh, crawling across the Death Star. Um, but soon I realized, well, let's uh, start. I, I watched the other model makers. They were working on the Princess's ship, and that's one ship I didn't work on, the Rebel Blockade Runner. Uh, they were working on that, and this was after about three days, and I noticed how they were doing it uh, was uh, they were taking five-minute epoxy. Uh, they were taking the plastic part, the auto model kit part, putting a little five-minute epoxy on it, and then taping it to the side of the model. Well, my partner and I were already working in industrial design for a number of years, and we had access to materials that, that just weren't available uh, retail. And one of them was super glue. So uh, it was called Eastman 910. And what I did was after about three days, I brought in a bottle of uh, Eastman 910 super glue, and I took a pencil and I cantilevered it out off the table, two thirds the distance of the new, new uh, pencil. And I put it, I said, everybody, everybody stop for a minute. Everybody meant these five people. And I said, everybody stop for a second and look and see this. And I put my finger on the pencil and I put the dot of super glue and then I moved my hands. And everybody was like, how in the world did you do that? You know, we're over testing the pencil and figuring out. And I said, well, this is a super glue and we really need to be switching to use this. So industrially, I bought some and brought it in, and it really changed the speed. Um, in a way, I, not that I would say it, but in, in books that have been written, that said that it changed everything. Superglue changed everything. Changed the speed. Would we have ever been able to finish the movie using five-minute epoxy and, and tape? Um, is a much, much slower. You know, you could... How many parts could you put on? And then you had to wait. The glue started to get stiff, and then you had to mix up some new glue and on and on and on like that. So that and the fact that I, I must have done something, and I can't remember which. It had to have been the princess's ship or something, and I was really good at tubes and making what I call the mandalas, these compositions. And I did a little something, and from that point on, Grant, who was the head of the shop, he asked me to initiate project after project after project. Uh, like I did the whole engine area on the Millennium Falcon, that whole back end or half of the top. That was my whole thing right away. And it was like, wow, okay, they love that part. Then I think I was asked to do the engine part to the uh, sand crawler. And then I was asked to do um, the escape pod, which I call a one week wonder. Uh, the remote, uh, the fencing remote for uh, for Luke. It was like one after another, and it was uh, like Grant said to me, uh, "We need a fencing droid." And I said, "Well, what do you want?" And he says, "Well, go up to the art department and ask them what, what a fencing droid drawing." And so I went up there. Joe Johnston. Uh, he said, "Oh, just a second. Give me fifteen minutes, okay?" 
I went downstairs, 20 minutes later, I went upstairs, he gave me a little pencil drawing, and that's, the remote was finished in two days or three days or something like wow. that. So it, it was, uh, uh, oh, and also the, um, the escape pod had to be done quickly too. It was like a one week wonder also. And, and, uh, I took two paper paint cans and you, by the angles that you see, one is a truncated cone of the top upside down paint, you know, a, pla a paper bucket mm. that you get. And the bottom one is exactly, it's the same size. Uh, so it, I was used to industrial ways of doing things in industrial design. And so uh, I think the speed with which I could do those things and, and the materials that I knew what to use and uh, uh, really got me in um, what's called the catbird seat. I don't know if that's in English. Uh, that's uh, it's the ideal spot, you know, the, okay. uh, <laughs> the ideal. Uh, I was asked to do things for being a, 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 a neophyte, <laughs> neophyte. Um, I was like, Whoo, you know, it was, it was really when I, especially when I think back about it, you know, I think when I think back at the time, it was just uh, speed, speed, speed. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and also we were working 11 hours a day. So it took me almost an hour to drive there. So um, we were spending most of our lives there. And then we stayed late too. Uh, and we didn't necessarily leave at uh, eight at night, you know, or uh, that kind of thing. I mean, does it uh, ever amaze you that, that obviously the work that you did back in the 70s on the first movie and how much of an impact that that film has made literally worldwide. For example, The X-Wing. You know, I, I, I've had the honour of actually holding one of the screen oh. news X-Wings <laughs> from the trench run. And oh. I've got to say, it's so delicate. The detail in it is incredible. I mean, roughly, and there is a meaning to this, roughly how much would you say it cost... In, in materials to make, say, like an X-Wing? You know, um, you kind of have to take the X-Wing as, as a whole because once we made one, we had made molds and, and that speeded things up. But, you know, one of the, it's, it was so long ago, it'll be 50 years um, uh, next year in the summer when we started. That's a long time ago. Mm. And the way I describe it is money was different then, so I describe it in cars. And, um, you know, making an X-Wing through all of its steps and its explosive models and everything was probably a Toyota, a mid-range Toyota, that kind of thing. The, um, the really, you know, we, it, everything got more and more expensive. And some things are Ferraris. Mm. Uh, some things that we did uh, were, you know, back then, a Fer but a Ferrari... I have to modify that because uh, you know a Ferrari could be bought for fifteen, twenty thousand back then. Um, so very rarely, uh, a, a modern like um, Mustafar, uh, you know the a lava planet uh, mm. of uh, Sif, that definitely was an, a very expensive Ferrari. Uh, <laughs> it was it was huge. It was uh, almost as big, bigger than half a tennis court. Um, involved many, many people doing uh, air, hot, uh, hot lights, uh, you know, cooling, air conditioning, uh, so we wouldn't melt the model, you know, a lava. Uh, uh, even after we sculpted it, it was really a big deal. And it was shot after shot after shot was done on that model. Mm -hmm. So especially if you include the stage crew and camera and everything, it was, it was a very, a very exclusive uh, modern uh, Ferrari. I, but, mean, um, I, I mean, the reason why I mentioned the X-Wing and the cost is because um, not that long ago, very, very recently, that X-Wing went up for auction. And and can you yeah. guess what it went for? I think it was four million or something. Or red two leader. Point, uh, just under two point four million dollars. Yeah. Whew. Which is yeah. when you look back on actually making it, it's incredible. And it just shows how much of an impact that that that, that yeah. you and the team has made yeah. on the industry, which which is incredible. I mean, looking at yeah. Star Wars, I mean, which which sort of uh, project on that film was the most challenging that caused you the most amount of headaches? 
you know, I, I don't think I had a headache. It was so exhilarating always, even after 35 more or more years, you know. Uh, the thing is that uh, I have to go back a little bit. The, uh, the experience, was, there was an, absolutely nobody that you worked with that was a drag. It, it was like being back in the best of people in your friends in the art department in, uh, in university. You know, it was, everybody was contributing and the, uh, it was like uh, the, the repartee on, on whatever you were doing was just energizing, you know? And, I, I, and I'm not exaggerating, it, it really was. I, one of the guys, one time, uh, he was in an interview like this years ago, and, and uh, one of the things he said was, says, you know, I could not wait to go to work. I'd wake up in the morning, I'd get that cup of coffee and a bowl of cereal as fast as I could and get to the car to get to work, you know, and then would stay there late and then come back again and do the same thing the day after day after day. And that same guy one time called the model shop late. It was like, you know, nine o'clock or something like that. And he asked one of the guys to come and get him. And he says, I'm at this and this and this uh, street. And they said, well, you're very close to work. What, what, are you, what are you doing? And he says, just come and get me. Just come and get me. And what he did was he rolled his car coming around a corner <laughs> too fast. <laughs> and so he, he, the tow truck was going to take care of the car. He just wanted to get to work. You know, oh. so that that was an example, a radical example. <laughs> um, but um, let's see, your first or your original question was, oh, what gave me the most headache? And it really was the most challenge, challenging, mm. um, because um, once you're asked to do something pretty major and incredible, uh, it ups the ante of your of expectations and expectations from everybody else and you become this kind of a, a a really efficient kind of creating machine that uh when when people expect you to give come up with an answer creative answers uh one after another after another you feel that you have to that's mm -hmm. that's part of the thing you know but it's it's this interchange thing that starts to happen too uh, but you, uh, you know, quite, quite frankly, actually, the, one of the most challenging, if you want to go into depth, was actually for a film that was not that good, was Wild Wild West, the dynamics of it. It's just that what had to be done, had to be done in a month and a quarter. Before the rain started, we had to match the summer sun in Arizona. Uh, it starts raining always to the end of October. It was shot and completed, and it was perfect on the one take, and it rained the next day. It would never, ever be possible to have to duplicate Arizona in the um, summertime mm -hmm. uh, using the sun at either 11 o'clock or 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock. So, and I was responsible for that uh, thing, and we worked uh, day and night practically to accomplish that. I mean, you worked um, as well on, you see, in a lot of films, it always makes makes me chuckle when um, you see rocks falling and they sort yeah. of bounce. <laughs> and they yeah. even, like, you see often them bounce off the actual actors, um, which that, is, yeah. looks used like to happen old polystyrene. Yeah. Yeah. It used to happen in old Western, black and white Westerns when I was a kid. <laughs> and that was... You know, maybe when you're five years old, you don't much think about it, but when you're 10, 11, and 12, you do, <laughs> yeah. Um, but you come up with actually, a, a, a method for Wild, Wild Wild West as well, didn't didn't, didn't you, for the rocks? Yes, it, something it, to do with the it was. What it was was uh, I knew uh, I was asked to have the collapse of Monument Valley and these big structures, and... Um, I knew what happened in the film and, you know, had to look big and all that stuff. But the big deal to me was, yes, we did. I was going to have to make the rocks out of foam, um, foam or plaster, but it didn't use plaster. And I knew, I remember thinking, ah, beanbags. I'm sure they have that, that kind of a thing in England too, if they don't call it. Mm. You, it has a bag with beans in it and kids throw them to uh, hit a target and that kind of thing. And they don't bounce because uh, the inertia of the beans as they fly through the air 
when it hits the ground, they compress and they don't spring back. Uh, it, it continues to compress and pressing down. And then I thought, ah, in, in uh, the U.S., we have a thing called a dead blow hammer, a dead blow a mallet. A big, I'm sure they do in England, too. Mm. And it's plastic. Uh, it's about, you know, a foot, a little bit more than a foot long. And inside the plastic is a lead shot with oil. And that's what makes it not spring back. So it's blow, it hits, and the blow continues. And it's more effective than one that springs off. You know, like we've all seen people make medieval swords and they spung, bang, you know, the mallet off of the, off of the sword. So that was um, what I thought, ah, that's what I'll do. Um, there's a company called Nalgene that has all these plastic jars in every size from two inches to eight inches, 10 inches. And the big rocks had big jars in it with oil, with a lot of lead shot, little, and they I made up a, a special boring machine to, a boring tool to, to be able to put these into uh, and foam them into place. Uh, little number, hidden numbers to tell which level it was at and all that stuff. And so that's how the way it was made. And it fell into um, uh, crushed walnut shell sand. It wasn't really sand, it was, um, in England, you don't. I don't think you grow walnuts. No, I'm not sure, but where, wherever you do, it's a, a an industrial material used in uh, filtering and that kind of stuff. But you can buy it, everything from eighth inch crushed pieces down to fine, finer than uh, sand, uh, finer than flour. You know, you cook with. But anyway, that was uh, it was very successful, and I also think back about it. You know, no one, no one. In that's filming it, the stage people, the production people, they never say, uh, oh, geez, how did you do that? It's like so assumed that you're going to be doing it and it's going to happen and it's a succeed that I remember thinking a number of years like, yeah, I'm the one that has to tell how it's done because no one came to me and said, you know, Lauren, that shot was really great and, and how you did it was uh, miraculous. Those rocks didn't bounce. So it's those things, the miracles happen, and yet it isn't like people go like, oh, that was a miracle, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, it's just assumed. I mean, how how secretive is sort of your work? Because you're coming up, you're like a pioneer. You really are in, in, mm -hmm. in the way of coming up, for, you know, with solutions. And there's obviously other teams out there working on other films. I, I, I mean, <laughs> do you keep all your secrets to yourself? Um, so it aids ILM and your... Yeah. progression you know that wasn't really true or part of the whole thing you know what uh once i moved up north you know because i um after i did uh, star wars and uh, half of galactica then i was asked to move up north and so the other people that uh spread out from well they formed a company called galactica in the same location did star trek but some of those people spread out and over the years and made their own little company so there were actually people that were friends that we worked with that we uh, sometimes uh, if we couldn't, uh, our stages were all full, we would take a model down to one of the other companies to shoot it there with their equipment, which was an offshoot of the Dijkstra Flex. Every, everything at that time was the second and third generation of the Dijkstra Flex until Disney came along with another system. But um, no, I, I remember uh, calling up Grant, who was the head of the shop for uh, Star Trek, and tell him about a, a system of a really great rust that I'd come up with. You know, I was spraying the object with a matte spray and then uh, taking iron powder and blowing it through, you know, a tube like that and making a dust. Uh, and then you would uh, have a, a, a incredible, a juice, I mean, a liquid that you would oxidize it with and did all the little runs. It looked perfect like miniature rust. So um, we were probably more inclined to share with the people that we knew than uh, the, yeah, we, we definitely did because there were people we knew. I, in mm -hmm. fact, uh, one time Grant called up and he says, you know, I've heard that you guys are kind of, uh, kind of in the gap uh, time for a couple of weeks. You want to come down and work on uh, um, the go um, Caddyshack. So I flew down and, you know, stayed at a friend's house and, and worked on Caddyshack for about two weeks and then went back. So uh, it wasn't, um, 
it was humorously and fun competitive rather than necessarily uh, holding your cards close to your chest. Mm -hmm. uh, it didn't work that way. I mean, you build these spectacular sort of um, sets, you know, like the pod run and, 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 and other incredible like looking sets that look incredible on, 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 on camera. Once they finish shooting and they tear these sets down, how does that make you feel? Because of all that work that you do, I mean, what, what do they do with the sets? Do they cut them up into pieces and keep, keep them in case they've got to do reshoots? Or is it a case of they just destroy it all? Well, our, our obligation is to do three shots. You know, so the model has to be be there. And so we do the first shot and it stays there until they see dailies to reshoot, that kind of thing. But uh, you're right, big sets, there is nowhere. Who, who's going to pay a warehouse to store them? You know, because uh, some of them are really, you know, like I said, the half a tennis court kind of thing or a quarter mm -hmm. of a tennis court. Um, there's some that I really regret, you know, that it wasn't more, wasn't saved. And that was the... Um, execution arena for um which film would that be uh clones i guess it would be um the little bug guys that flew around and tried to uh execute uh princess uh, amadala and uh it was a beautiful sculpture and the way it was done um you know i i was the head sculptor on that we did it with first machetes then uh, knives and uh when the crew of about four people, we would carve, carve, carve to the artwork, uh, concept work, and then everybody would go home and I would take a, a sandblaster but with the walnut shells that I mentioned. It's called Jet Blast and it's used for cleaning the, um, the fins on jet engines because it's non-metallic. It doesn't actually wear away the metal, but it cleans away the debris. It's used to clean the sides of ships and things like that so it can go in the ocean without uh, polluting fish, uh, that kind of thing. And uh, so I would only shoot up, so it deteriorated it like a stalactite stalagmites. And so even though we'd carved it with knives and had sharp little edges, by the time you shoot directly up on it, it deteriorated it and made it look much more organic. That I really regret that it wasn't uh, saved. Um, it would have been a great exhibit. Um, but one of the guys at the model shop, in, a, in an interview like this, somebody asked him about big sets and what do you do with them? And he said, well, we never make anything bigger than would fit in a dumpster. You know, <laughs> we never make a model bigger than it fits into a dumpster. And I, I'm sure you have a slightly different word for it, but a big debris box kind of a thing that, uh, you know, 12 foot by 8 foot by that kind of thing i've been to elstree quite quite a few few times and seen those big dumpsters uh full of things yeah. and you think to yourself i wonder what's in there but i'm not going to jump in because i'd get a quite yeah. a few fu fu funny looks uh for sure yeah. i mean obviously with the age of your sort of profession uh we we have seen film change We've seen the introduction of IMAX and 4K, and it's been getting, you know, better the actual image. So how has how has that influenced the way that you've worked over the years with things getting more detailed on screen? Well, uh, the thing is that we we probably it's almost like you don't want to tell the director, but I'm sure he doesn't care anymore. We we over detailed things in the beginning right from the beginning because it was so much fun and the you know after the rear end of the millennium falcon was done and the engine area and then the engine area to the sand crawler it was like whoa that really it upped the ante you know of what the expectations were and we were our own judges at that time because george was in uh, george lucas was in england so uh, he wasn't there day after day during uh, kind of that middle period and, um, you know, with the quality of uh, the film and the image at the time, we could have gotten, probably could have gotten by with less detail. You know, it's one of the things that we watched uh, 2001, certain parts of 2001 over and over again. And one of the things I noticed was that uh, when the ships were moving, uh, the details uh, held up, but they didn't have what I called interconnectivity. And they didn't have, 
if there was a box that you would think would be a plenum and, a, and then a pressure box, it didn't have tubes and pipes between them. There were isolated pieces. So when it was a, more of a still shot, you could see that. And I thought, hmm, that would really add to the reality of the thing. So that's one of the things that we did. It was like, oh my God, it has to look like it goes from a carburetor to an air intake to a, you know, even though it's out in space, it had to look like it, what you and I and, and kids know, you know, ah, that was, that's how it looked like an engine compartment. That looks like an engine compartment. I know that. Um, so we were doing that kind of detail right from the beginning. And, you know, if, if there had been accountants, uh, and on board, they would have been going, you know, come on, come on, people. <laughs> this is falling through space. It's not a still shot on this particular model. So uh, details, uh, we, we really enjoyed. I mean, when you look back at uh, something, especially when you look back on YouTube to old uh, rock and roll concert and everything, you think, oh, the image was so awful. I mean, you can barely tell it's Eric Clapton, you know, mm. uh, that kind of thing. Uh, the sharpness of the image is, is a delight, really. And, um, uh, you know, that, that kind of thing. But anyway, um, it, was, it was very much, um, even when CG came along, especially at the beginning, it was very much a hand and glove situation. We worked, it was, a, it was a joy to have them add things, you know. Yes, the model got sidelined more and more as time as my end of my career happened but um there was a long period of time in which we actually after jurassic park someone said to me a uh, dennis murin supervisor said you know i think you guys maybe have three more years well three years turned into you know 25 years or something like that um it wasn't wasn't true it seemed like it though i was mm. somebody oh my god gave me this book because they knew that it was a little depressing. And there was a book called, um, oh, what was it? The Color of Your Balloon. Like, where are you going to go from here? Kind of, that wasn't the title of it, but, uh, you know, how a, a new career, creating a new career, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. And I looked at the book and I was like, oh, you know, I didn't actually read it, but I, it, I, I thought, what a cruel present. <laughs> I mean, you, I mean, you talk about CGI just a moment ago, and I've got to say, we're seeing more CGI in films and TV programs. So how important do you feel practical effects has in film today? Because the reason why I enjoy the first three Star Wars the most is because mm -hmm. of all the practical effects, because it just felt real. It felt which it was. Yeah. You, so, I mean, how do you think it is affecting the industry now and are we and I, I know you said that uh, he, he told you three years and obviously that's many moons ago um, mm -hmm. I mean with map painters as well that that is like a sort of a, a skill and an artistry that is near enough gone now I mean do you think at least uh, impact the industry? With, uh, yeah painting with brushes and uh, oils and acrylics is gone but map painters still you know uh, still it's a lively uh, there's more map painters today than there ever was during Star Wars, uh, but they do di do them digitally, you know. Mm. Um, the mo and as far as models are concerned, you know, yes, a lot of things seem so unreal mm. as compared to uh, model making then. And it, it all, the thing with games too, the games came along and people didn't mind uh, cameras being able to, you know, go through the tube and anywhere like that. It was magical for sure. But when we were originally working on Star, the Star Wars series, uh, Dennis Murin again, who was the supervisor of effects, he would say, well, how, where is the camera? When you do this kind of a shot, where is the camera? Is the cameraman a foot high or two feet high or three feet high? Or, or is he on scaffolding somewhere? But he's not, he's not flying around like a drone. You know, it's it's, a, it's equipment. There's heavy equipment. There's camera, and the, there's a certain logic to that. Same thing. The same thing with rocks. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the audience wanted to. Where is rea where is reality here? Whereas 
a camera being able to travel through vessels of the veins and flying up over the top and going through a window is a wonderful thing. And, and Orson Welles did that in um, Citizen Kane, you know, going through a window and into the room and that kind of thing. But uh, the Marvel films take that to such an incredible extreme these days. It's, mm. um, you know, how many times can they destroy New York City and who rebuilds it? <laughs> People like you and me, you know, our dads <laughs> were the ones that <laughs> had to rebuild New York City all the time, you know, or, or London. But this is the thing, the, you know, the nostalgia part of it, I think, is wonderful. I mean, one of my favorite movies of all time is Superman. And to see sort of the, I think it was Derek Meddins that worked worked on that and, and, and seeing the miniature work on that and as well as like Ghostbusters and Hook, which you've worked on, yeah. which is one of my wife's favorite <laughs> movies, I've got to say. Uh -huh. um, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, what would you say to any aspiring sort of model makers or, or someone that wants to get into this industry, what's the best advice you can give them with the industry changing so much? Well, I, I've certainly talked to a lot of young people uh, about uh, what to do in careers and what they're interested in. And it doesn't always necessarily lead to model making. You know, uh, there are a lot of good model makers and uh, you know, quite frankly, when there's a lot of something, the price goes down. It's, mm -hmm. it's like happening with CG people, too. Um, somebody uh, that worked in production said, the pity of it is, is we're working the CG people so hard that hard-nosed money people realize that, you know, we work them real hard. They aren't able to learn the new whatever Maya or whatever new thing is coming along. And there's always 20-year-old people 25 year old people coming out of college that already knew the newest edge programs. And they do many times replace the worn out, tired people that you work seven days a week. I mean, maybe that might be a bit of an exaggeration, but you can see um, it becomes a little bit less uh, humane, <laughs> you know, um, when there becomes too many of something, uh, too many uh, access to so many CG people coming out of college. Uh, actually, more what's more satisfying for me, in a way, is I, I, you know, I've asked young people. Like this young woman uh, was trying to do a high school um, senior project, and I asked her. Her mother asked me to talk to her, and um, said, "Well, what are you interested in?" She was interested in mathematics. She was really good at mathematics. She was um, she was interested in art. Um, but she wasn't necessarily a good artist herself, you know, drawing. Um, she was interested in architecture. And so I knew a, a, her, her high school had a very interesting neoclassical building. And I told her to get the longest lens she could, uh, get a friend with a big, long bamboo pole painted black every foot, every other foot, you know, uh, photograph the building uh, by as flat as you can and that there's a really interesting mathematical relationship between all those parts because it's a neoclassical Greek building. And you'll, you'll find that, it's, it, that you're amazed at, at what you'll find. Didn't, I didn't talk to her for years, for like six years. And her mother came across me at a garden party in the summer and said, you won't believe what happened. And I said, what? And I says, you know, uh, Maggie, uh, you know, got an incredible grade at high school. She went on to college, studied architecture, uh, eventually became a restoration architect um, in San Francisco, which has a big, you know, there's a lot of buildings to be restored as there is in England too. And uh, she's getting married to one of the architects in the office and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and said, happy as a clam. Uh, and those kind of things happen to, I've, I've, there's probably engineers out there that, have talked to me at one particular time or another, you know, or industrial design too. That's mm. one of the things that I was involved in. But um, I'm not sure strictly model makers. The world has a, you know, Yugoslavia, England, Germany, uh, everywhere. There, there is, there's, like I wasn't. When you look at that, I was not the most incredible model maker in the world. They're out there but I was fast, <laughs> you know, I did it uh, on time and on budget and, you know, without getting tired, uh, I got, yeah, I got tired, but the amount of stamina that you 
when you're 20 and 30 years old and you put into something and you put into something that's like, I'm sure that uh, Winston Churchill and his people as the, even at their age in World War II, the stamina that they put into it was mm -hmm. far beyond what any 50, 60 year old person could put into anything that wasn't that important. You know, and Star Wars and all those films felt that important. So the the amount of stamina that you came up with uh, was almost beyond uh, the human. Well, you obviously are good at what you do because you look at your IMDb and literally it's every single classic, iconic and epic movie that yeah. there is out there. You brought out a book in 2006 called Sculpting a Galaxy. Uh, oh, yeah. Which is focused on Star Wars. Have you got any, you know, sort of plans on maybe bringing out a memoir about everything that you've worked on? Sort of like stories from Indiana Jones or, or, or Star Trek Generations or Men in Black and, 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 and do sort of a memoir based on your whole yeah. career? Yeah, uh, I certainly have ha done that. And up to my right are several journals with uh, notes after notes after notes after notes. So, you know, uh, two sentence lines of what happened at one particular time to write about later on and add to. And I've done some writing. The problem, is, one of the problems is I'm not a born and bred writer. Mm. Uh, I'm a two finger typist, that kind of a thing. And uh, and I have, there's a, there's a journalist in London uh, a young woman that was my intern at long, long ago, and uh, she have I, she and I have talked about collaborating. Uh, she's a good writer and all that. And uh, it's there's so many things that happened uh, that I'm I'm doing and interested in. Uh, you think retirement is uh, full of full, full, full for me, uh, uh, for most part, enjoyable things, and. Um, I kind of I work on it for a while, then I don't work on it a while. But there are a million stories, and I have a, a very very good memory, as my sister does and my mother does. Um, my mother remembers. I've sat with a ninety two year old woman and talked about her high school and boyfriends and dances and you know first time going to Vancouver and that kind of thing. And she has a vivid uh, until she died a couple of years ago, but had a vivid vivid memory. So I remember stories that people go like, how in the world do you remember that? And what was happening in 1975, you know, or 78 or 82 or 84. Um, I mean, is there, but, a, is there a story that you can share that, that may actually surprise us about your work that, that, that we may not have known uh, before? Uh, can I tell you a fun story? But it, it's, it's while working but not necessarily, uh, mm. what it is is, um, I guess I didn't even ask for your permission, I wait for the permission, but I <laughs> headed on into it. And that is, um, three of us were sent to Guatemala to do the shot of the rebel ba base uh, guard up in the tower. And um, so uh, we flew to uh, Guatemala City, then got on to DC-3, one of the tail dragger World War II airplanes no no regular seats you just got strapped to the side of the plane and had i don't know if it had chickens in there but it had you know, nets of uh, stuff on it to land because it had to land in the dirt runway in the jungle there and when we got there there were these little palapas a little uh, frond colored uh, huts that we each stayed in and there was another bigger hut where you got breakfast lunch and dinner uh, actually not lunch but um and it, it was the same thing. Uh, it was eggs, beans, and uh, uh, tortillas. Uh, those were and coffee. That was the and chicken. Uh, there were chickens running around all over the place, and um, so we had dinner. And uh, that particular night was you know really basic. We weren't expecting any more than that. But at, for dessert with coffee, we got a coffee cake, and it was about. Uh, an uh, inch and a half by two inches by that thick of coffee cake. And one of the guys asked uh, the woman over, who was kind of the waitress, cook, um, everything, 
said, you know, we're working on a film here and uh, we're bringing certain money, hiring some of the locals to help get the equipment up. You know, maybe we could have a little bit more cake for dessert. And uh, she, you know, she might have, whoever knows what she actually said. But the next night we got a piece about four and a half, four and a half by four and a half by that thick again. And we were kind of pleased with ourselves and all this stuff. And a young woman came over to the table and said, you know, guys, from now on, I'll be eating with you. And we, we said, oh, sure, sure, you can eat with us. And why, you know, um, no problem. And I said, well, what, what made you think of that? And she said, well, look around and see how much cake everybody else got. They didn't get any because they only had a pan nine inches by nine inches. And they cut uh -huh. it up depending on how many people were in the, you know, they probably had one little oven and one little pan and all that stuff. So we had, we said, we called her over and said, you got to go back to the old system, you know, because everybody was giving us dagger eyes, you know, for, <laughs> for getting the, the wrong cake. And, and also when we got to the top of the pyramid, we realized it was a lot more dangerous than we thought it was because a, a, an Egyptian pyramid is about 52 degrees and uh, a, a Mayan temple is much steeper. Uh, the the steps you have to go up like 20 inches to go on a four six inch tread so mm -hmm. the rise is quite good and it's like you slip and you you could have a problem and so i was the only one that didn't have kids so i was the one that was up in the tower in a costume uh because there was only three of us we we tried uh we tried with uh, one of the natives uh that had the machete that helped us through the jungle uh but he wasn't the others. I'm not a born and bred actor either, but at least I know what instructions are. And he was so stiff. And so, um, he just, he just didn't do it, you know, he didn't do it with a flare. And, uh, so they said, well, somebody's got to do it. And so I was the one, but, um, there you go. So a, not only are you making, uh, spectacular things, you're also starring in it, which is awesome. I mean, have you kept anything? from any of your movies as a keepsake, sort of like as a memento? You know, I, I was, I think the majority of people were like, you know, that wasn't something you, you do. Although certain things, a lot of things got thrown away. You know, the, the Death Star was this giant thing that had to go in the dumpster. And uh, a couple of people uh, thought, ah, you know, I should put some of these in the car and take them home. And people did. Um, also, like I said, there were things you got rid of. And yes, I, I did keep things as keepsake. Although I, my preference is to, at home, I don't, um, I don't have anything like on the walls. I don't have posters. I don't have, uh, you know, I was more interested in architecture. That's what I would, thought I would be in the beginning. And uh, so I, I, I re when I retired, I remodeled... Uh, you know, the kitchen and remodeled rooms and uh, bedrooms and bathrooms and all that stuff. So, uh, but anyway, things did arrive in the trash and there was a tower from uh, the large towers. There were small towers about six inches and there were big towers about 19 inches. And um, I saved one. Well, I put it in a box way back in the basement. And there were people, this was like, you know, now there was 30 some years later and people were asking, you know, do you have, we, we would buy, uh, we put up for auction. And I said, nah, no, I don't have one of those. I remember giving one to Larry, uh, one gay Charlie Bailey, but uh, I didn't remember. Anyway, I was, you know, like eight, 12 months later, I was in the garage, in the basement, saw a box way in the back and open it up and lo and behold was one of the the towers with a stepping motor in the inside and it uh, it went for you know high-end uh, car high-end toto or a low-end bmw wow. and um at auction it was uh so even you know little little tiny things that i i did keep but you know not to exhibit i just kept it kind of historically mm -hmm. and um and in a way though my wife would say well they're just in boxes back there why 
you know, let's, we got to clean out that room. And they say, well, okay, I'll put those up for auction, you know, and did. <laughs> It sounds like my wife with my collectibles that I collect. Um, she doesn't yeah. understand because they're all in bo- bo- boxes in a room. I mean, you also won an Oscar in 1985. Uh, have you still got the Oscar? Is it somewhere, uh, you know, spectacular uh, or is it in a drawer somewhere? Uh, no, it's not in a drawer, but it is. Uh, let's see. It's kind of behind where the bookcase is and all that kind of stuff. I'm not sure. Let's see. Wow. And you there's see, your baf- BAFTA as well. I see. Yeah, there. the BAFTA. And then um, also, I, and then behind that, I made a 40-year one, which is uh, only five of us. I gave them to five people. Can you see the Darth Vader? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Oh. And uh, so that's that's kind of the extents of, of, of the stuff film-related that I have out. But it's around that corner. Um, well, it's nice. It yeah, the, show, shows that you're very, you're obviously very humble about your work. I, um, I mean, do you ever, do you ever realize how important that your work, uh, the effect it's had on people and and the industry, or do you just see it as, you know, your job? Do you realize, like, literally, how much of a legend you are towards, you know, other people in the industry? Well, it would hard be hard to avoid. Actually, you'd have to work at it really crazy, uh, like crazy to totally avoid that. But, you know, um, the best of people, even though they might all of us have big egos, to be modest is, uh, oh, you know, that old hubris stuff. You know, remember what happened to uh, both Shakespeare and classical mm-hmm. Greek people and all this stuff. There's always the, the undoing, you know. Uh, one One time... One time, somebody in publicity, in, in uh, not publicity, in uh, at one of the departments, she asked me, she said, well, they've contacted us, and they, for a magazine, they want to do, uh, oh, what was it? Some of the most, uh, you know, the, I don't remember what the title would be. It would be, uh, you know, one incredible human being we want to, in, in the world here, we want and I, I told her, I said, you know, I, it sounds to me like I'm putting myself out as a target right there, you know, with that, that description. And I, I don't really want to do that. Um, you know, it just sounded like, you know, that on the internet, I mean, you, you wave your flag too high and you get those millions of people will shoot you down. Mm-hmm. You know, there has to be, uh, um, yeah, you're modest about things, but, the truth is that Star Wars related things, all those film things, I, I get to travel around the world with a bubble. You know, this, uh, there's a, there's an aura that I can't see that, that isn't there, but I can call upon, call upon in an instant, you know, mm. um, you know, I might, uh, I might, uh, overwork it a little bit, but you know, cause I can, I got so used to coming up with answers to the physical pro- physical problems that uh, I can be places where people don't want to necessarily hear from a stranger the best way to do something or another way that they didn't think of doing it, mm. you know, or, or even to, you know, I've sat in the, I'm sure you have either Home Depot or something like Home Depot, you, uh, you know, lumber and things like that. Uh, I would just, in very recent memory, I can think of three different times of standing there at a distance and seeing somebody tie something onto a car and realize it's not going to work, you know, and all the knots and, uh, uh, you know, all the rigging and things that we did. So I'd stand at a distance for a little while and then go, you know, would you like a little bit of help? You know, how, how to actually do it. There's things like what's called a trucker's knot that truckers use to tighten up ropes that because people just tie it loose and then they you know etc and i've I've seen things that oh my god this is going to come out on the freeway these two women uh, are using string and i gave them my nylon rope you know to to make it so that other people didn't run into that piece of furniture coming out the back of the car Uh, but there's other things like that you know it's like Mm. you wouldn't happen to have a phillips head screwdriver would you 
you know, that's a, there's a problem here. Uh, but even more than that, you know, as a knowing sometimes it's welcome, but sometimes you wonder, well, maybe sometimes it don't, they don't want to hear from you all the time. Mm -hmm. Of, of your better solution you know but. before we bid farewell because i'm looking at the time and, and literally your career and and your experience really needs to go into a memoir because uh, you know what you've you've lived like a hundred lives i've got to say um over your career but if you could go mm -hmm. back in time to your younger self before you started this crazy journey in the industry what advice would you have given yourself at the start, knowing what you do know now? Uh, you know, I have a, a, a funny one uh, having to do with that, uh, because one of the guys retired a couple of years ago. He was a little bit older than me that didn't work on the first Star Wars, but we were having lunch with him, and uh, somebody said, uh, of the six or seven people said, well, Giovanni, what would you have done if uh, uh, over again? And he says, you know, I would have worn knee pads more often. <laughs> and because because you spend a lot of time on cement floors, you know, mm -hmm. uh, doing things, um, I probably would have uh, exercised more, as I, you know, we thought. Well, I got all my exercise and I got paid for it, you know, at work. So, but but that isn't necessarily the same. Uh, I was I was lucky that I my both my parents were slim and everything like that so I stayed about that same way you know uh, that didn't wasn't a real problem and it never physical things never seemed like a problem but uh, everybody turns seventy five and and more and um, the machine and now I'm starting to go to the gym uh, you know but I never never did I mean I never the work was so. Uh, intensely physical at times mm -hmm. especially near the end when we did really big sets you know it's um you're crawling all over these big sets i remember one time thinking wow i almost fell what would be like for a then a 63 year old guy falling 15 feet onto a cement floor how long would it take to recover from that mm. you know and uh, i nearly nearly did it uh, part of my my own fault for what I was doing, but um, <clears throat> yeah, that's what what I um, <clears throat> I would have uh, said. Be more more careful of your relationships, you know, your primary relationship, that kind of thing, because uh, it starts to feel like the most. It is the the most important thing in the world, you know. Whether or not uh, there's oil in your car, whether or not uh, you know you've eaten, all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, I'll just pick up a, a burger again on the way home. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll pick up a pizza again, and uh, that kind of thing. I'll, I'll eat standing up at work. You know, lunchtime comes along, but you're doing something that shit. I'll just grab something off the table here uh, and uh, keep moving. And uh, that isn't the best thing for a human being. Mm. But I was lucky. I, I didn't. Uh, here I am. I'm on the cusp of 80 years old. And, uh, you know, most people say I don't seem, you know, don't move like an 80 year old. Don't talk like an 80 year old. I, I've even hired guys in the yard, uh, three, three brothers. No, they weren't brothers, friends. And uh, I was working. I, I said, I, I should do the chainsaw work. I'm, I don't want to have three guys I just hired do the chainsaw. And uh, at the end of the day, they asked me how old I was. And uh, I was as much, I was a little older than the cumulative age of the three guys. And uh, they said, you know, our grandfather <laughs> doesn't, uh, you know, doesn't do work the chainsaw or any of that kind of stuff. So, uh, Mm -hmm. I kind of lucked out that way, but you know, still, when I look back, there were there were certain things like that that I. Uh, but it, it, but as far as work concern, I I don't think I've changed changed anything really. Maybe not looking at laser light a little bit uh, when we first got a laser, go yeah. home with headaches. You know, <laughs> that would have been a nice thing to to avoid. Definitely those little blind spots and stuff like that. But uh, 
It's been a good conversation. It's been an absolute honor to have you on the show. And and yeah. it's incredible the work that you've done. And I look forward to this potential mem- memoir. Uh, you need to get on this because there are going to be so many people out there that will buy it and will read it back frontwards, upside down. So, Lorne, thank you so much yeah. for coming on to the Swayu channel. Look after yourself and keep safe.